cream? Yeah. You want ice cream? Okay, everybody smile. obvious statement. We all know this to be true, but I don't even know there's like the image you portray on Instagram, right? There's what you say on Instagram, right here. Instagram, right? And then there's reality. <laughs> reality. And, and what, what I want to do for the next couple of weeks, we're actually going to just pause our Apostle Paul series just for a couple of weeks and talk to you about a burden that it's so deep in my heart. I just come off a preaching break. It's summer vacation. By the way, it's fall. How many people are ready for fall? You ready? But, um, and during the summer, yeah, some of you say, no. <laughs> I heard no in the audience. <laughs> but really deal with the issue for two or three weeks and jump right back to the Apostle Paul. Kind of this gap between our, our, what we say we are on Instagram or the picture we portray. And, and let me just say, let's all agree that we all do it, Right? We all do it. Now, some of you aren't, aren't, you're not on Instagram, so you're the spiritual ones. <laughs> but we all have this image that we portray. We have Instagram, then we have reality. Matter of fact, here's what's interesting about this, and then we'll get into it, is that in church life, it's called we have sunny mornings and then reality. We have sunny mornings and then, I was going to say Monday morning, but how many people, by the time we get to our car, sometimes we don't connect the dots. We have, hey, everything's good, and at church we look like awesome and love my church, love my pastor, love Jesus. But when I'm in the car, it's a different story, especially on 405, anyone in the house, right? <laughs> especially when somebody, there's, a, there's Instagram and then there's reality, and I want to just spend a couple weeks really bringing up this conversation and I hope to wake up something at New Life that all of us at least acknowledge that there's a tension there. And we really ask, I'm asking that in the next couple of weeks, the Spirit of God, as we go back into the fall, we go back into school, we go back into the energy. How many of you are ready for some routine in the house? You ready? Routine. Come on. That, that we really would wrestle with this conversation that I think is so critical in our today's world. So how many of you are ready for a couple of weeks of talking about be real? You ready? Good, good, good. Now, before we jump into the message and kind of where the series came from, I want to take a moment. At New Life, we operate not on a calendar year, but a fiscal year. A fiscal year, we do that primarily because we are a church that has a school, Christian education, that runs um, September through August. And so every year at this time is our fiscal year. And I like to take a moment at this time, this Sunday, just to express my gratitude to New Life when it comes to your giving and your kingdom builders and your tithe and your offerings. Let me just say this really loud and clear. We could not have a church that's healthy, that's reaching the world, that's taking the gospel across the street and around the world without the giving of New Lifers. And, and I want you to know, as your pastor, I never take that for granted, and I speak on behalf of myself and Jana and our elders, never take it for granted, people that um, obey the Lord and the tithe, their first fruits, and then going beyond that in our kingdom builders. And um, the last couple years, the last 24 months or whatever it's been now, how many people, you don't even know how to refer to the pandemic, right? 
But the last, the last couple of years, I mean, that's been, a, it's been, it's been just dicey and what's going to happen, how that happened. And New Life, you've been faithful. You've been faithful with your giving. You've been faithful with your tithing. You've been faithful in your kingdom builders. And as your pastor, I want to tell you, I'm so grateful for the generosity of New Life. And I want to say thank you on the behalf of our elders. Come on, can we give the Lord a hand for his goodness and his faithfulness throughout these last couple of years? All right, be real. Where this comes from, during the last few weeks, um, the summer, I had a preaching break, and you get away, and man, you do some, you examine, you do reflection, and what's going on in your heart. And I read a book that I want to tell you, I, I bring up this book but with a caveat, warning, this book will mess you up. So do not read it unless you're ready to like, wow, have a, have a life change. There's a book written by John Mark called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. As I started to read this book, I'm by myself, I'm reading the book. God really used this book and John Mark Comer to transform, uh, at least I'm in the process of being transformed. Acknowledging that we live in a world that's hurried. Everything has to be happened now. And that there's never moments where we even know what it means to slow up and enjoy the presence and the power of God, and enjoy one another. Even when we eat, eat. I mean, if it's not there immediately, the other day I ordered something online, and so, I mean, here it is, all of a sudden delivered my house, and I want it, I want, <laughs> this sounds bad, but Jenna, go get at the door and bring it to the couch. I'm going, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Everything is hurried. Everything, in the argument of the book, again, I warn you, I don't, like, totally agree with all of it, so it's a good book. All of you will read it just because I don't agree with all of it, right? But it's a book that says you will never truly have a, a life that's right with God and right with one another if it's always done by the clock and by hurry. And what John Mark does, it was fascinating, he goes on the journey of time, he goes all the way back to when early, early back in time, we, it would be the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun, and that's how we kept track of time. And he went through the, uh, the journey of how we have changed with time. Then he brought up something that is so obvious, but it, helped, it just was worded. You know how something can word something right in your life and catch you? That's what happened. He brought up something that happened in 2007 that literally changed the landscape of everything. And let's see, who knows what happened in 2007 that changed the world when it comes to hurry and time and culture? It's the introduction of the iPhone. I want you to think about that, 2007. That's only 15 years ago, where if you back up, and some of you here, let's say if you're, you're 20, 25 or below, you're going like, you don't know a world without an iPhone. But the iPhone has changed the world. Now, let me, I, I'm young enough, I'm young enough or old enough or whatever you call it to, to remember. I remember um, when the, the laptop, the former senior pastor, Rick Ross, his advice to me when it comes to my laptop, he said, don't, like, don't touch the laptop, get rid of it. That belongs to your executive assistant. Can you imagine like doing a job or life without the computer right now? I remember that day. I remember the day where literally on, on the computer, I started right on the computer and I didn't trust the computer. So I would literally bring a, la, a, a printer with me everywhere I went. And so literally when I was traveling, I would carry a printer with me because I didn't trust the computer to save my documents. Our world has changed. The world before us has changed. There was once a day where we didn't have in front of us a phone that carried Wi-Fi access, that we could do anything and everything by the power of this thing called the iPhone. And we as a culture have to wrestle with that because it's changed even our ability to be with one another. It's changed our ability to connect. Matter of fact, when you read the book, if you read it, um, John Mark brings up that this is how many times we touch the iPhone a day, over 2,600 times a day. And by the way, this is not an altar call. Let's bring all of our iPhones to the altar right now. <laughs> Some of you are going like this. Oh, no, you're, we're all on it. You're going, that, that's not what this is. Matter of fact, I hope that this little mini series that we do will just bring the conversation alive at New Life. I hope that we dialogue about it, that the impact 
that this has as it relates to reaching people for Jesus, as it relates to our kids and our grandkids, how do we respond to the fact that we are touching our phones over 2,600 times a day? Matter of fact, it depends on what stats you read. It's three to five hours a day we are driven by this little thing called digital connection, our iPhone. Matter of fact, there are studies out there that will demonstrate, even if you, if you have your phone on you, and let's have a moment of just reality for a moment. How many people have your phones on you right now? Come on, right now? Yep, every one of us. Every one of us, right? Except the spiritual ones, you left it in the car. <laughs> even when you have your phone on you, even if it's turned off, listen to what they've said, even if the phone is turned off, that phone just being with you will reduce someone's working memory and problem-solving skills. Jan and I are wrestling with this. We are wrestling with how healthy is this? How do we find moments where we slow down and we just enjoy God? And honestly, we enjoy one another and we enjoy people that we come in contact with. How do you do that? And honestly, this is, I could give an altar call right now, we all respond. Because every one of us have to deal with this reality of the power of the iPhone. Let me tell you, my greatest concern, it's the iPhone that's pastoring the next generation. That's discipling our kids. That's showing our kids what it means to be a human being. What it means to be uh, uh, someone that is healthy and godly. It's social media that's having a greater impact than the family and the church. And I think, come on, New Life, the next couple weeks, that we truly have to wrestle with the question, the difference between Instagram and reality, and how do we connect during this time? Because here's what I believe with all my heart. We cannot grow spiritually. In other words, our mission is that we, we lead people in a fully developed, fully, fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. You cannot grow spiritually if you are not known by God and known by people. And just knowing my Instagram page or my social media page doesn't mean anyone knows me because I can make the page say anything I want it to say. And not even on purpose, like on accident, I post only the shining moments of my life. But knowing my shining moments, I will never truly be fully devoted to Jesus Christ unless I'm known by God, unless I'm real, Unless God knows, and God knows everything about me, but I'm real about that. And there's somebody in my life that could say, hey, I don't care what you post. You need to get, like, something's off in your life. Somebody close enough to pray and be there. And so, New Life, I know this is, like, a little bit uncomfortable. I, I get it. It's uncomfortable. After I read this book, Jan, I, I, can't, I don't even know how to date right now. I don't take you on a date because I want my phone to come with me. And so one of the things in our home practically, and we're not there yet, so don't clap yet, but we're trying to not bring, <laughs> I'm not there anywhere, but like don't bring my phone when I'm out with Jana. Like leave it at home. I'm not there yet, come on, right? <laughs> but trying to bring in the rule of life, some, some guidelines that um, we can be healthy human beings, we can love Jesus, and we can be known by God, and actually somebody knows us. And this is why this fall we're relaunching our life groups all the way across the board, our rooted groups. Let me tell you, I want you, I want you to be known by God, but not only God, but somebody knows your name, somebody can pray with you, somebody can encourage you, somebody is not impressed with your social media followers, they just like you. So I think the problem is we have a lot of friends but on social media, but we have no friends. And we have to wrestle with it. We as a church have to do the good work, saying, God, how do we do this? So here's the question we'll take on for the next two or three weeks, is how, how do we be real in a picture-perfect world? How do you be real in a picture-perfect world? How, how do you do that? How to, how, to, how to let our humanity and not just live with this unintended consequence behind social media, but how do we be real in a world that's image driven? How can I have friends and just not social media friends, but real friends? That's what we're gonna deal with. How many people are ready to go there? You ready? How many people, how many people are like right now you're on your phone, right? right? 
let, we had to put this question on the table and wrestle with it. And I was talking to our staff and we did a retreat. How do you, how do you wrestle with that? Instead of we, rejecting it, but how do you like leverage social media and digital connection for the glory and honor of the kingdom of God? Amen? So here's what we're going to do. To start the series, we're going to take a look at a passage in 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. Let me kind of frame this passage for a few moments. One of the reasons why I like even the phrase, be real, and one of the reasons I, um, I am a person that believes in the Bible, this is so critical to understanding the entirety of the Bible, Genesis, Revelation. One of the reasons I put my faith in the word of God, because when you read the ancient text, you read scripture, you find that God's, the landscape of God's narrative, he, the scripture can be defined as a real book. Humanity is all over the book. In other words, if I was writing the Bible, there's a lot of things I would have left out if I was God. But you see in the Bible, humanity, that you find out in scripture that we're all a hot mess. Scripture is not an Instagram portrayal of God, it's real portrayal. For example, when you read the Bible, you find that God uses like liars, like Jacob, he was a liar, and you have that story in the Bible. How many of you know that's not something you're gonna post on social media? Hey, I'm a liar, but I'm a good man. It doesn't happen. Or you find David. Here's David. We're going to look at David's life. He like has this affair and he kills a guy. And it's like posted in the Bible. Like one of the reasons I love, absolutely love scripture. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. My introduction to Bible was memorizing half the New Testament as a ninth grader. And one of the reasons I said yes to the Bible is because it's so real. You have Peter denying Christ and yet still used by God. You have, Peter, you, have, you have Paul and Barnabas getting in a big fight and still recorded in scripture. I love the Bible. If you're newer to Bible study, here's what you need to know. I think you should read it for this reason alone. It is so real. You have the, hum, real, the humanity all the way through it and yet God is still glorified in our weaknesses. Come on everybody, right? God is still honored. And what you have in scripture is the sense that God doesn't want our image, he wants our reality. God wants our reality. God wants our hearts. God is not impressed with how many likes I get. Anyone in the house? God's not impressed with how many followers I have. Matter of fact, in the kingdom, the kingdom way of living, it is an entire different filter than we use in our culture with who God looks for, who God puts his anointing on. And I'm telling you, one of the, what God puts his anointing, the entire Christian faith is based upon this sense of being real, not being fake. And I think a lot of preachers and a lot of churches have spoiled Christianity because we kind of like pretend we put up this false image instead of letting people see our humanity and letting people see that, that as a Christian, we can be real, right? All right, so 1 Samuel 16, here's what's going on. This is we visit the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel, and what's going on, they're being led by kings and prophets, kings and prophets. Side note, even though God didn't want to give them a king, he did, and they have a king. They have a wicked king, Saul, and even though they had a wicked king, God was still in charge. I think that's critical for the narrative of God. Sometimes we go, well, what's going on around us? It doesn't look normal or people are wicked or whatever, but God says it doesn't matter who's in government or politics, I'm still Lord of what's going on. Come on, and so that's what's going on here. And so Saul's the king, he's wicked, Samuel is the prophet, and he's coming up, he's going, now we're gonna appoint a brand new king to lead the nation of Israel. And that's the story. That's the story we enter into right here and who God chose us is, is so amazing to me because it says something about the kingdom of God and what God looks for. So First Samuel 16, the Lord says to Samuel, hey, I want you to take your horn with oil and be on your way. I want you to go on your way. I want you to take this oil. Oil reflects or represents the presence and power of God. I want you to go identify and appoint the next king of Israel. So what happens is I'm sending you, God says to Samuel, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. 
I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Let me pause here. here. When you read the Bible, slow up. And here's a hint to Bible study. Anytime you see something that you see later on in the story, it's like when you're seeing a movie and there's a hint, circle the hint. Here's a hint. Jesse is from, and Bethlehem is what? Come on, it's where Jesus was born, everyone, right? Bethlehem. This is the beginning or a hint of what's going to happen in the future. And we see Jesse is from Bethlehem because, side note, Jesse is the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus. And we see even in the middle of a wicked king, God is still narrating his story. God is still in charge. And we see this with the subtle detail that Jesse is from Bethlehem. I have chosen one of your boys to be the king. And so Samuel goes, and when he arrives, Samuel saw the firstborn. He saw Jesse's firstborn and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. He sees the firstborn of the seven sons. And Samuel goes, that has to be the one because he has all the outward qualifications. He's the firstborn. Here's the next king of Israel. And God says something to Samuel that I want to wake up every new lifer. He gives us a kingdom principle that is so powerful that every mom, dad, every aunt, uncle, or grandparent, you got to get when it comes to even raising a next generation. He says, God says to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. In other words, don't consider everything that the world consider, his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. It would be like God saying this today, don't consider his followers or his likes. In other words, the way that God anoints people is not how the world does. He says, don't consider all the out, this is so big, all the outward things. Don't consider his Instagram picture or really what's going on, what's the reality. Don't consider his image, but look at his integrity. This is so big. Because Samuel's just doing what's right by the culture. There he is. He says, don't consider him, because he says, the Lord, this is so big, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at, The way that God looks at humanity, every one of us, he doesn't look at the things we look at. People look at, it says this, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, what God really cares about is not all the outward beauty, not all the things we look at, but God is looking for a heart. David is known as a man after God's own heart. When I think about our Christian school and I think about our children's ministry and I think about our youth culture, our youth church, our young adults, and we want to pastor next generation that would have a heart after God. And yet when they go to their iPhones, they're not learning that. When they turn on the TV, when they go on, on TikTok or whatever it may be, they're not learning that what really matters is what happens when no one's looking at you. What God really cares about, he's not impressed with Instagram. He's impressed with our reality. He looks for a man or woman after the heart of God that is known by God, that is known by people. What's going on here right now, it's like this moment in the narrative of God, the the God story where he says, I want to remind you, I care about what you're like when no one else is watching. He says, No, the firstborn, even though he has all the qualities, he's not the one. And so what happened? Jesse took the seven sons and and passed them before Samuel. It was like the first bachelor. It's the first rose party here. Come on, Brian Jenkins would have thought that was funny, by the way. But this big rose party, who is the chosen one? Who is the one that God has chosen? But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these, these ones. And so he asked Jesse, he says, Jesse, are these all the sons you have? And I love love what Jesse says, well, there is one other son I have, but you're not going to really like him. He doesn't even post on Facebook. Can you believe it? Like nobody knows his name. 
Nobody like follows him. He doesn't get the proper likes. That's so big. There is one of my, one of my boys, I'll bring you to him. He says, he says there's still the youngest, Jesse answered, and he is like tending the sheep. He's just like being a good human being. He's taking care of what he's responsible for. He's being faithful when no one's watching him. They've just David. He's tending the sheep, this is so big. He doesn't even have an iPhone, can you believe it? Like it has nothing, it just, he's tending the sheep, he's doing the work of the heart, the work no one's watching. That's who it is. And again, this entire series is going to be totally counterculture. I, I get that. No, one, no one's going to be telling you this kind of stuff. Again. It's like it's all about how many followers, how many likes, and can I become famous on YouTube overnight? We need to teach another generation how to tend the sheep and how that really what's inside is more important than the outside. And I'm telling you, and then not only teach them, but remind ourselves. God's not impressed with what happens on your Instagram or let's be like for a moment church-wise, God's not impressed like you come to church and you look really good. He wants to know what you act like on Monday morning. He wants reality. He's tending the sheep and Samuel says to him, send for him, send for him. We will not, we will not sit down until he arrives. Poor David, he shows up. He shows up and he sees, I missed the rose party, but there it is. That's the funny thing, everybody. Come on, right? All of a sudden, David arrives and he's just being faithful. He's being a man of God. And he shows up and Samuel says, so he brought him in. And Samuel said to him, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Rise and anoint him. I have chosen the one that is the youngest that's tending the sheep that nobody cares about, that he doesn't know how to have all that image, but he cares about his integrity. Come on. I pray that every one of us, the Spirit of God, would use this couple week series we're in at least to start asking the question, what are we producing? What are we passing on? Are we in such a hurry that we miss the very things that make us who we are? One of the phrases that we're using here at New Life that we hope to model and even reinforce some of the things, how to respond to the iPhone and social media, here's a phrase is that digital connection should reinforce community, but it should not replace it. In other words, if your only friends are on social media, you have no friends. It should, come on, reinforce it. Social media, digital connection, we wanna make Jesus famous. We wanna reinforce it, but there, ladies and gentlemen, if all I'm doing is living behind, I'm talking to not only adults right now, but the entire next generation. If all I'm doing is defining my identity behind the iPhone, I'm hiding behind it, I'll really never have true community and true discipleship. Come on, we say here at New Life, you can't want another one another without one another. And we can so hide behind social media that we literally never have true authentic community. This is why this fall we're ready, the next few Sundays we are ready at New Life to say yes, let's jump in. Let's call people back to community. Let's call people back to discipleship. Let's call people back to be fully devoted to Jesus and Jesus alone. Come on, this is why in a couple of weeks, Brian Jenkins will be here and we're doing Theology One Day. Why? This is going to be a Theology One Day where we talk about what Christians believe. Come on, we need to return back, if you will, to some of the old-fashioned, just what we believe and how we live it out. And we need to say, yes, we're going to be this as a church and great community. This is why we're doing worship nights in a couple of weeks. And then we're leading up to group launch on September 25th where we are every new lifer to get involved in a group that you're known, 
that somebody knows your name, someone knows your face, somebody knows your story, somebody can pray for you, where somebody, where you don't hide behind the iPhone and social media, but actually somebody is not impressed with that, but they like you. They like you, not just your picture. And they're involved. And we want to do everything we can. I realize the last couple of years has kind of thrown all these rhythms off a little bit. But all of us need to be real, and you can't be real behind an iPhone. You can't. It may reinforce it, but at the end of the day, it will not replace true community and true discipleship and true connection. Let me give you, how many of you are ready for one last illustration to kind of make this land? You ready? This illustration is so big because it means so much to me. I live in a home that was built in 1896. I love my old historical home. And I love showing people my home because when they walk in, it was built back um, when they actually knew how to build homes. <laughs> Just kidding. But they built homes differently, and there's charm, and there's character. And so when people walk in my house, there's all types of comments people will love. They love to see my tall ceilings, the character of the house. They love to see my floors, my cabinets. There's just all types of character throughout my house. But here's a reflection I've made over the years that's real critical. I have never had anybody, when they walk in my house, want to see my foundation. Nobody. They don't come in... They, they comment on the character of the house, the historical nature. It's a cool-looking house. But nobody says, hey, by the way, how's your foundation? How's that going? But all, as all of you know, that the most important part of my house is my foundation. It doesn't matter all the flair of my house. It doesn't matter how tall my ceilings are or my hardwood floors or the beauty of this old charm. That doesn't matter. If my foundation is not strong, it will not weather the storms. It does. And again, I like having wood floors. I like having cabinets. Nothing's wrong with that. But without the foundation, it's like not, not going to weather anything. And I'm telling you, my question for you is, how's your foundation? When no one's looking, what are you looking at? Who's identifying your identity? Who knows you? Are you real enough to say to someone, man, I look pretty on the outside, but there's some real issues going on in the inside. Be real. I guess I'm asking all new lifers to ask, how's your foundation? And then... Not only yours, but your kids. If that foundation is being developed by TikTok, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. So I'm asking all new light, be real. Let's have the courageous conversations. Let's get a little bit like the rule of life. What's the rule of life in your home? Something, I don't know what it is. We're trying to figure out the Jones home. Trying to figure out, I want to do silly things and my kids are laughing at me, but I'm trying to figure it out. Like, I want to get a basket. We all throw our phones in there before you come in. I don't know. I'm kidding, ish. I don't know. <laughs> but we have, to get be, we have to get real as a church. And we have to start asking foundational questions and not all the cosmetic around us. And we have to ask what's happening. As school starts, what's happening in the hearts of our children? Be real. Don't hide. You can hide. You know, well, it's not happening. It's happening. Someone else will pass our kids if we don't. How's their foundation? How's your foundation? How's my foundation? What are we becoming? Is it, if it's only an Instagram picture, that is just the cosmetics of your life. It's not the real you. Be real. Amen? Now, before we stand and pray... Just a little house cleaning here. Just this is for Kate and reminder, worship band, this is your cue to come up. Yeah. They they got out of the rhythm while I was on a preaching break. Let's all stand together. Lord, I pray as we go into a time of worship now, God, that you'd stir our hearts. Help us to respond to the teaching of the word. Even in our worship time, help us to repent, help us to reflect, help us to be the church. 
God, I pray for every new life, for every new lifer. God, that together we would throw this conversation on the table and talk. And we wouldn't be legalistic about it, but God, help us to develop the rule of life, some rules around us to guide, to guide the house, to guide our home. God, I pray that you'd help us have the wisdom to see social media and digital connection, to use it in a way to make Jesus famous, to reinforce community, but never replace it. Lord, I pray for this fall as we launch our groups, that every new lifer would jump in and we would not get lost in the image of Sunday, but the reality of people knowing who we are. Lord, use this series, use this series to do some good work in our hearts, good work. God, I pray this for the Jones family, good work in our family, good work to identify what's going on and how do we create some guidelines, guidelines and guardrails and the rule of life to go forward and be fully devoted to Jesus. So I pray for this worship time right now, Lord. Help us to worship. I pray that every one of us are just engage in the presence and the power of God. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.